My name's Sean Doherty, and, and, and as Dave mentioned, I'm a associate professor at Vanderbilt University. Um, but, but back before uh, I turned to the academic side, I was a high school math teacher in suburban Philadelphia and a high school assistant principal. Uh, and as part of my roles at that school, um, I was a liaison to our local, local technical career center. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, the predominant model for CTE delivery and uh, what was these half-day centers. Um, and I both taught math to students who attended the technical center and then became the liaison to that technical center, administrative liaison when I was an assistant principal. And so a, a lot of my uh, practice-based exposure to CTE came through those roles and really informed my interest in learning more about what I perceived to be uh, the positive impact or, or, or you know, benefits, spillover effects, uh, in some instances, of, of participating in CTE in high school. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, that is very much the focus of my research, and, and I'm excited to, to sort of uh, provide some, some context, uh, both from a policy and practice standpoint, as well as what I think we, we know or what it is we, we hope to know uh, and work in the future. So um, it, for, for, I'll just say here by way of introduction to, uh, forgive me for some of you who know CTE well, some of this will be a bit repetitive, I'm sure, but, but just in trying to speak to a broad audience, I'm going to try and retread some ground uh, and then hopefully add some value here as well. Um, so it's an exciting time, I think, for career and technical education in the U.S. Uh, it's, it's kind of interest in CTE and policy focus has increased over the last uh, 10 years or, or, or 10 or 20 years, really. Um, but most, reauth most recently, with the reauthorization of, of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act as the Every Student Succeeds Act, kind of shifting focus away from just accountability plans to emphasizing both college and career readiness, so bringing the work preparation uh, standpoint into the policy for the, for the first time in a while. Um, but that also, you know, the associated accountability plans have extended the range of measures, some of which uh, now explicitly are, are meant to be connected to career preparation in ways that can be more inclusive of CTE than in the past. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, or just in a few years after that, the reauthorization of the federal Perkins bill that, that provides these block grants to support states' uh, expenditures on CTE was reauthorized. And that also has increased emphasis on, on different types of measurement, goal setting, uh, focusing on, on job relevant outcomes, and on, and on aligning program offerings very explicitly with labor force demand, uh, which I think for the, in many instances uh, was already a part of common practice, but, but by codifying this in the law, uh, hopefully will help create some more alignment where alignment was, was weaker uh, over the last few years. So, um, you know, importantly in all of this, there's greater focus on the role of credentials and certificates as possible ways for students to signal uh, what they've learned across their high school experience and to help smooth the transition to the workforce and also hopefully uh, provide some, some you know, in increased pay as a result of having those. Um, <clears throat> also today I'll highlight some uh, policy challenges. Anecdotally, there, there's lots of discussion about difficulty with teacher recruitment and retention, uh, and, and, and of course that exists broadly in, in teacher education um, and teacher policy, but, but is uh, especially acute in, in career and technical education where we know the people who would teach these programs have uh, generally very strong job opportunities outside of teaching. Uh, so, as many of you may, may know, uh, it's kind of CTE as we know it now, uh, in part in terms of federal efforts to support CTE, uh, the Morrill Act of 1862 under President Lincoln establishing land-grant institutions and focusing on improving ag agriculture and mechanical arts uh, as the country industrialized and there was need for larger scale agriculture uh, was, was some of the first federal investments in CTE. And then just over 100 years ago, the Smith-Hughes Act, based on efforts between the private sector and the federal government, uh, was the first uh, public investment in, in CTE by the federal government in the K-12 space, uh, so it brings it back then into primary and secondary education. Uh, but of course, when, when this happened 100 years ago, and, and now through over the, one, the last 100 years, 
um, you know, CTE and, and vocational education previously was really, has really been at the center of, of this conversation about, you know, what is school for? Uh, is school meant to prepare you for work? Uh, you know, is it just about being an informed community member uh, or is education good for its own sake? And I, and I think largely uh, disagreements, uh, philosophical disagreements have, have often related to questions about poverty and upward mobility and, and salience depending on one's socioeconomic standing. Uh, and for understandable reasons. So what, what does the current landscape of CTE look like? Uh, so if CTE has been around for a long time, many of the programs that still exist have been in place for some time. For instance, uh, agricultural programs have been around uh, for at least since the, the late uh, 19th century. Um, but you know, currently, na nationally, about 20% uh, of all high school students can what the federal government considers a CTE concentration. So they take three or more aligned courses in CTE during their high school experience. Um, these courses are aligned in a, in a single program of study in order to count as concentrators. And these programs of study, there are about 80 of them that, that are now sort of recognized uh, and agreed upon across states. And, and those 80 programs are nested within 16 career clusters. And in this slide, I have a graphic that, that I borrowed from the, the website you, you see listed there, but, but I thought it was a nice pictorial presentation of the 16 different clusters. Um, and, and so they're, they're wide-ranging and inclusive of, of long-standing programs such as agriculture, uh, long-standing and growing programs like health sciences, uh, relatively uh, new programs like information technology, I mean, relatively new in this 100-year uh, span, uh, and, and then, you know, rapidly expanding programs in areas like uh, STEM and human services, uh, to, to name just a few. Um, so, so, you know, CTE is not monolithic. It, it is highly differentiated. There are at least 16 different ways we, we might think about describing this, uh, not to mention the different places that CTE uh, takes place uh, in terms of how and where students learn. Um, so, you know, often students are first introduced to, to, to career technical education in middle school. Uh, it was common when I, when I was in middle school, and, and it's still the case, uh, to my understanding, that students get exposed to some elective CTE courses during the middle grade. Um, while those exposures tend to be fairly limited and, and just about, you know, exposing students broadly, there, there are different efforts afoot to, to make career awareness or early career exploration much more explicit in, in the middle grades. Um, but in high schools, you know, classes are offered. Uh, those classes, if they are, you know, aligned classes in a single pathway, uh, if they accrue to sort of between two and four credits uh, or, or more, Students complete a concentration. Completing a concentration is what makes schools eligible for, for uh, some of the Perkins money from the state block grants from the federal government. Um, outside of classes, there's lots of engagement, typically in work-based learning uh, or applied learning experiences, the opportunity for professional certifications, and then career and technical education student organizations uh, as, as you know, the experiences to augment the overall educational uh, process. Um, I think increasingly importantly, given what we know about the, the importance of post-secondary education for long-term employment, uh, where we define post-secondary, so I'm saying college here, but really I mean post-secondary education broadly, so short certificates, long certificates at community colleges, associate's degrees, uh, all the way up through bachelor's and advanced degrees. Um, but increasingly CTE in high school includes dual enrollment or early college options to help get students both exposure to college while in high school and to accumulate credits at lower cost when making this transition to post-secondary education. Um, in many instances, there are explicit transition plans or articulation agreements that are meant to also help smooth the transition from students from high school programs to, to post-secondary programs, uh, often with an eye towards there being certificates or credentials that are stackable across time that, that lead to sort of career advancement. And, and, and importantly, they don't have to, have to happen seamlessly. So whereas in previous for emphasis on education policy was increasing the number of students pursuing a four-year college degree uh, based on what we know to be the, the, the long-term payoff of obtaining a degree, uh, there's, there's also 
uh, an important now acknowledgement or increasing uh, acknowledgement of the fact that, that sort of attaining a four-year degree eventually uh, can happen in ways that are, uh, that are not necessarily continuous uh, but, but can still be sequential uh, or that there can be multiple credentials earned across one's uh, lifetime or career that, that are related but not necessarily culminating in a bachelor's degree. So what, what I say are the big questions in CTE at the moment, and these are by no means exhaustive. I, I'm hoping uh, you all will raise some other big questions that we can discuss kind of later in the hour. Uh, but the way I've laid them out here, um, what are the benefits that we think CTE might provide to high school students? Uh, should CTE be a, cap, a path to college, and if so, for whom? Um, you know, what CTE program should be offered and, and who's going to make that decision and, and based on, on what information, uh, when should those things change, and uh, what models of CTE have been shown to be effective on what outcomes and for whom. And, and uh, you know, I have something to say about each of these four, but especially on the last point, we have lots of good anecdotes, we have lots of good case studies, but part of what got me interested in this area was while I could add to the anecdotes and case studies from my 10 years of being a teacher and administrator, uh, I didn't have any hard and fast evidence. And unlike in, let's say, early literacy, when I turned to the literature to, to look for evidence of what works and under what conditions, I really only found one, one sort of experiment that could support cause and effect sort of interpretation uh, from the, you know, the MDRC evaluation of career academies. Uh, the last report of which is now over a decade old. And so when I was embarking on this, you know, eight or so years ago, uh, that, that's sort of what motivates the, the last question. As it turns out, there's a lot more evidence now than there was even when I was getting started, and, and some of that evidence is on the horizon. I'll, I'll try and highlight as much of that as I can during this hour, uh, and I'm happy to help connect folks with that uh, if, if, if what we've got prepared in here doesn't already. Um, you know, so what do we think the benefits are answering the first question to CTE? Um, certainly my experience has been, and now in my research, I, I can show that there's evidence of an improved engagement in high school. So both engagement with academic content as well as social engagement uh, and general uh, participation in high school. So the way we see engagement uh, in terms of like so social and participation is through enhanced uh, attendance and lower uh, in fewer instances of, of disciplinary infractions leading to suspensions. The way we see it in terms of content it is by, by, by better grades or, and or test scores. Um, you know, there's also the potential, uh, certainly we think, for skill development related to future employment. Uh, this is one of the areas where, while the evidence has not been sort of cause and effect or causal in the past, there's a long-standing line of research that sort of supports the notion that's based on theory that, you know, getting trained in specific skills in high school should lead to better employment and earnings outcomes after high school. Um, and then, uh, you know, la the last piece, and this is in a world where we're increasingly thinking about over one's lifetime the need to engage in, in post-secondary education, uh, the potential for CTE programs to help increase familiarity with uh, college-aligned programs. On, on the topic of, of post-secondary education and, and tackling the second question, should CTE be a path to college, and if so, for everyone, you know, it's worth pointing out that despite the fact that we are at record high high school graduation rates in, in this country, uh, still about one in five or just under one in five, maybe one in six students does not complete high school. And, and we know now in terms of social outcomes that er earnings, health outcomes, uh, Interactions with, 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 with the criminal justice system are, 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 you know, all of those outcomes are much, are much worse uh, for individuals who do not complete high school. Reliance on, you know, the social safety net is much higher. And, and, even, and, and so we, we, we sort of really expect that not completing high school is a bad outcome. And with one out of six students still not completing high school, interventions that are designed to help students complete high school, to keep them engaged, to help them find a path to the workforce uh, seem particularly salient. Um, a second point I'd say is, you know, not everyone knows what to study in college or, or how to make a well-informed choice, either based on their own strengths or interests, or also on what jobs are, you know, what degrees or programs are likely to get rewarded in the workforce. 
Uh, and so I, I think that that is a fairly common experience. And, and you know, enrolling in college and taking classes and satisfying requirements doesn't necessarily, though it certainly can under the right circumstances, but it doesn't necessarily set folks up for success and preparation for, for a career after college. Um, Despite those two caveats, we know that there is still a really strong return on investment for college degree completion and or certificate completion and uh, increasingly post-secondary trained skills are, are, are demanded in the workforce. And, and so there's, uh, I think, a tension here. And the, the way I will unsatisfactorily resolve this tension is to, to say, you know, I think a key concern from a policy and practice standpoint is avoiding unnecessary and unrewarded debt. So having students enroll in college and not complete a certificate or degree that pays off for them often results in debt without additional uh, sort of return on investment, so, and so no improved you know, workforce outcomes, and, and students are, are net worse off in terms of their financial position. Um, and I think one of the ways that, that we can, as a community, at least speak to this partially, is to emphasize that immediate enrollment in college is not necessarily the most important outcome, uh, nor is it uh, re strictly required for, for someone to pursue uh, a, you know, a college degree or a certificate eventually. Um, though awareness of the importance of college and helping students still find their path uh, remains crucial, but I think that is one of the potential benefits of, of high school CTE. Thinking about you know, what CTE courses are offered, what programs of study are offered, and, and how that's decide, decided, you know, there are lots of programs that have been on the books for decades in, in high schools around the country. Many of these programs would be programs that are familiar to, to all of us. Uh, so we, we could think about you know, cosmo, cosmetology, auto mechanics, carpentry, uh, plumbing, electrical. Uh, those programs are, are longstanding. Um, many of those programs ha have demonstrated workforce demand, uh, but the fact is there's a lot of variation in actual workforce demand. There's also a lot of variation in who actually gets the skills, cert credentials, or certificates to go out and join the workforce in each of those fields. And, and so I think it's increasingly important um, that, that changes to local labor markets be reflected in changes in CTE offerings. Uh, at a state level, the state of Tennessee, where, where I now work and reside, uh, has taken a, on a, a massive overhaul over the last half a dozen years or so to take programs off the books that were no longer in, de in demand uh, and, and shut them down to, to produce a cost savings and introduce other programs that, that are in higher demand uh, and, and reflect the changing economy in different regions of Tennessee. Other states that I know have taken this on include Arkansas, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, uh, New York City, uh, it's a subset of New York State. Uh, so, so I think there's been lots of efforts on this front. But, but establishing a system to, to uh, determine what should get offered and, and how those offerings should, should change over time is important. And, and obviously, you know, all high schools are trying to develop a certain level of general skill development, you sort of math literacy, social awareness, scientific awareness, uh, but, but also, you know, in the setting of CTE, focusing on, on the demand for specific occupations and, and workforce skills, and, and keeping that balanced uh, it, it can be a challenge. Um, also, it's hard to part ways with programs if, in fact, they are no longer producing uh, you know, graduates for, for jobs that still exist. Um, and, and so grappling with that is, is in, in by no means a trivial matter. Though, though I'll just add an anecdote here that in Massachusetts, all of their uh, CTE programs that have an additional level of approval called Chapter 74 approved programs. So this is a set of state requirements that make programs available, make, make state level funds available to those programs above and beyond Perkins requirements. Part of the requirements for those programs is that they have local employers on their board. I, I know lots of places do this, but part of what the employers inform is how many students should be in the program based on local workforce demand, as well as you know, what, what equipment and, and training techniques they're using, uh, and then how to change that over time.
Um, so uh, I think uh, you know it's a good there's good opportunities for coordination exists between employers, schools, workforce investment boards, and other stakeholders. And, and the specifics of those stakeholder groups tend to differ by community, but getting the right people in the room and, and, and doing it with some frequency and not in ways that are you know, perfunctory, but actually result in updated expectations about uh, you know, what should be offered and for, to how many students are, are critical. Um, uh, but you know, w within this, a big challenge also, though, is the fact that in many contexts, we make investments in teachers uh, over the course of their career. And, and so a, a teacher who is trained to teach in one technical area but not another may make, uh, you know, create some frictions uh, on, on how you transition from either downsizing a program, eliminating a program, and then in turn perhaps introducing a program that is better aligned. And uh, to the fourth question, when is CTE effective? Uh, I'll, I'll throw in the caveat here that it is likely effective in contexts where we don't yet know it. Uh, and, and so, you know, there has been a limited range of, of, of what I would say is high quality evidence, evidence that supports cause and effect interpretation. Um, but, you know, that evidence continues to grow and, and people now as interested, policy interest has grown in CTE, so has research interest. And, and so I'm optimistic that efforts like the CTE Research Network that I'm a part of and we'll mention a little more later uh, will create opportunities for us to learn more about the conditions under which CTE is effective, uh, what models of delivery are most effective and for whom. That said, what we know to date uh, is, is that the, the limited causal evidence comes from whole school models of CTE. So, so one example of this are career academies. Uh, you know, career academies are often embedded in traditional comprehensive high schools, but the academy structure in a, in a study by MDRC led by uh, Jim Kempel, and I've, uh, I apologize, mistyped his co-author's name here, so apologies, um, found that there was a positive effect for boys on earnings after high school as a function of getting into, through a lottery, getting into, a, excuse me, a career academy. Um, other recent work from North Carolina looking at that a, a career academy focused on, on IT, so a substantively different focus than the earlier study, uh, but just one school uh, in, in North Carolina showed uh, large positive effects on high school completion um, and, and uh, initial employment. Uh, other work that I've gotten to be a part of ha has shown similar positive effects of getting into a specialized CTE high school in Massachusetts, uh, and now in a second study, Connecticut has shown uh, positive effects of graduating on, on graduating from high school, um, and, and then other other work using some nationally representative data, uh, but but uh, evidence uh, where where it's not necessarily as strongly causal, but provides really nice nationally representative evidence showing that you know getting exposed to CTE earlier in high school tends to increase student investment in CTE across high school uh, and leads to better high school completion evidence. Um, evidence on whether or not CTE in high school improves college outcomes is, is, is mixed. Uh, most of the available evidence suggests sort of no or you know, so zero effects or negative effects on four-year college going, uh, but there's some suggestive evidence that, that you know, going to community colleges may be enhanced. Uh, if not immediately, then over the, the in the, the five to seven years after high school, uh, and and so you know I, I'll just say here that, that some of the historical evidence is not clear that we should expect a positive effect on college going if what we think is in the short term students are better prepared to enter the workforce uh, and, and therefore uh, better informed about how to make uh, an effective transition from high school to to the workforce. Um, there, there's, I, I, I don't include any citations here, just in part because the, the number is more numerous or there's, is larger. Uh, there's clear evidence of positive effects in CTE on workforce outcomes. So I mentioned the career academies that are highlighted, the Kempel and, and Wilner MDRC study, uh, the reanalysis of that by Lindsay Page uh, that showed that the effects were larger the, the more heavily invested students were in, in sort of work-based learning activities, and then. Uh, recent evidence uh, that, that I've been a part of in Connecticut with my co-authors Eric Bruner and Steve Ross showing really large, like 30 percent 
our earnings are thirty percent higher for students who get into these specialized cte schools in the seven years after leaving high school um and and plenty of earlier studies that look that look sort of in the seven to ten years after high school suggest real benefits and payoffs in the workforce for students who enter um i'll just note here that despite the this sort of mound and growing uh pile of, of research evidence to suggest that there are there are clear payoffs to cte um i will note uh so two things one that all the, all the high quality evidence is coming from these from forms of specialized high schools um i'll also note that the career academy study and, and my study with eric bruner and steve ross in connecticut shows the effects are accruing mostly the boys. There's no evidence that girls are being harmed, but the positive effects are strong, uh, strongest and clearest for boys. Um, but that, you know, nationally, most CTE experiences in high school are, are not happening in specialized high schools. They're happening in comprehensive high schools or part-time technical centers, uh, like the one that I mentioned at the top of the call where I was a liaison as a school administrator. Um, and, and we have very little evidence from those settings uh, to really understand kind of whether and how they're impactful for students. Again, I think, you know, lots of us have uh, an anecdotes or some uh, sense that they, that they may be beneficial, uh, but, but there's so much variation in what those contexts look like, uh, and, there, and there's been, you know, less high-quality opportunities to really evaluate their impacts. And, and so we just know less in the spaces where most of the CTE uh, instruction and experiences are happening in high school. Um, and, and this figure here, uh, I'm just hi highlighting some work uh, that I did with uh, my colleague and co-author Isabel McDonald, um, showing that the, just the, the changing makeup of CTE over time. Uh, so we're using data, for statewide data in Massachusetts, and showing trends here in manufacturing technology and engineering and the green trend, uh, health services in the reddish orange trend, and information technology and the sort of blue-gray trend. Uh, it's the trend, if, if the colors don't show up the same for you, that shows the most dramatic increase over time. And this is just showing over, showing over the span of a decade that the share of high schools in Massachusetts that offer these programs, you know, in, in manufacturing and engineering, it's been pretty high and sustained. And in IT, there's just been massive growth as the, you know, private sector workforce in IT has, has expanded in the state over this same time period. So uh, I'm just highlighting here that, that you know, there, there has been uh, steady and sustained change uh, in general, but, but in particular in this case in Massachusetts. Uh, just borrowing another figure from our, our paper here, I'll, I'll show you that the, the solid uh, trends here are, represent the green is, and then the lower trend is uh, and the left-hand axis, axis, so so enrollment. Uh, sorry, I'm going to use the arrow here. Um, so this bottom trend in green represents enrollment in STEM CTE, and that corresponds to the left-hand axis. Axis. So so you're seeing the number of students enrolling in STEM CTE programs is increasing. It's uh, pretty substantially over this decade. Uh, at the same time, in non-STEM CTE, the red trend, we also see just general growth in enrollment in CTE. And so uh, what ends up happening is this dashed trend that corresponds to the right-hand axis, which is the share of CTE program enrollment that is in STEM, has been slowly increasing over time, uh, though the slowness of the increase is partially related to the fact that just generally enrollment in CTE is increasing over this period. And so not only has policy interest been, been increasing, but actual participation and participation in programs that are STEM aligned, uh, at least in Massachusetts, has been growing substantially. Um, and this is just one opportunity to, to point that out. Um, so in addition to the evidence that I, that I shared a few slides ago, I just want to point out that there's some other emerging evidence, not, not all of it yet published or out there in, in various uh, kind of working paper or, or policy brief form. Um, so Shadi Bonilla at the University of Massachusetts has done some work in California looking at competitive grants that were uh, competed to high schools across the state. And, and the, they were competed in ways 
that they got scored on applications and schools that were above a certain score got funded and those that were just below that did not get funded. And, and what she found was when, when schools were awarded competitive grants uh, to enhance their CTE offerings, that high school graduation improved, dropout fell. Um, and in, in, in addition, that like when people got a block of money that was meant to be spent on CTE, they actually spent it on, the, on their CTE programs. And this is a little bit of a surprise, is because oftentimes in you know, public finance we find that you know, getting an infusion of money in one area leads to, you know, it supplants other funds. They, they take other funds and spend it somewhere else now that they have this dedicated grant. Um, but what this showed is that, that in this you know, competition there was really enhanced, there was interest in enhancing uh, their, their capabilities and offerings in CTE and that as they expanded them, uh, that they, they seem to improve high school completion. Um, in another study from Goldring and colleagues, they're using a, a, a change in the way uh, CTE courses are being reimbursed by the state to the, to the schools, um, and, and by capitalizing on this policy change, uh, they're, they're learning that, in fact, they could induce higher levels of participation and higher levels of concentration completion in Michigan by, by creating uh, you know, funding incentives. And so they don't yet know the sort of long-term payoff for, for how those changes in course taking uh, you know, result in, in longer-term student outcomes, but I think it's, a, it's an example of what's on the leading edge of CTE research in terms of uh, providing strong evidence. Um, I mentioned earlier the Hemel, Leonard, and Pablo paper uh, evidence from North Carolina and Wake County where they look at um, what they're deeming a modern career academy or a career academy that's focused very explicitly in IT on, on sort of an emerging and growing field in CTE and find that even in that context where relatively high achieving students are sorting in uh, to IT programs uh, that there's still a benefit in terms of high school completion uh, suggesting that in fact engagement is improved, uh, and then they sort of back that up with some evidence that, that attendance in, in early, earlier in high school also improves. Um, and, and then just lastly here uh, in terms of uh, emerging evidence, there's been lots of good work being done here in Tennessee uh, by Celeste Carruthers in partnership with the Tennessee Department of Education uh, to show that, that earnings and college going rates have, have been sort of on, on the rise and in, uh, associated with CTE concentrators. Uh, and, and some of that benefit they postulate is likely come from the fact that there are some post-secondary pathways in these Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology uh, where, where there's some really nice uh, and I believe fairly unique CTE program alignment in the post-secondary space uh, for students who are concentrators in high school. And, and so I, I anticipate there'll be lots more that we can and will learn uh, from that work going forward. Um, so just to try and synthesize, you know, what do we know or what can we take from this? I, I'd say right now we've got some pretty solid evidence that whole school models of CTE uh, can be effective on a number of outcomes, including engagement while in high school, high school completion, uh, and improved employment and earnings. Um, there's some evidence from the work in California and Michigan to suggest that increased investment uh, by, by states or school, school districts in, in CTE can pay off in terms of more efficient investment uh, and, and students uh, graduating at higher rates. Um, uh, and some evidence that re, you know, reforming program offerings can likely improve alignment with workforce outcomes and then possibly students' willingness to participate in those programs. Uh, I'd, I'd say that the, you know, Benefits that we see to, to workforce outcomes and earnings are sort of consistent with what we see in some of the longer standing and less uh, causal evidence, but that the causal evidence is now backing that up, leading us to believe that it's not just that people who are more interested in working or more capable in ways that we don't observe are getting paid better, but, but that even when we have sort of random variation in who gets to participate uh, or what sort of CTE program they're in in high school, that there, that there are real cause and effect benefits. Um, a few caveats, you know, that, that, that we should be mindful of, uh, potential differences uh, for, by gender, that, that in the Career Academy study from MDRC and from the work that I've been a part of in Connecticut, we're, we're seeing these wage benefits uh, just for boys. Uh, also, in our case, high school completion benefits are just for, really for boys. Um, and 
in California, sort of the, the work from Shere Bonilla suggested actually that most of the CTE expansion as a result of these grants were in, when the, were in high demand health service programs of study, and that in those instances it seemed suggestive at least that girls might be benefiting more from the, from the reduced dropout. Uh, and uh, in, in that instance, the, the hypothesis is that the programs being offered tend to be uh, disproportionately participated in by, by girls. And, and so that maybe that is some of the reason that payoff is, is more substantial uh, for girls. You know, so, so why, why might uh, graduation workforce and college going be impacted uh, by, by CTE participation in high school? You know, I, I'd say that for high school graduation, when there are programs that align with student interests, uh, you know, if you can enhance the relevance of the work, that's going to improve engagement. Oftentimes, the multi-year nature of the sort of commitments that students make to programs of study mean that they have stable uh, cohorts of peers and, and mentors across years in ways that are often not replicated for students who, who don't have an investment in CTE. Um, you know, and, and that the opportunity to do applied work can help enhance self-efficacy, uh, and that self-efficacy that students find in technical work could then spill over into these other sort of core graduation requirements and these other uh, traditional academic courses uh, that, that, you know, induce them to stick around and complete their high school diploma. Uh, on the workforce side, certainly it seems getting early access and exposure to, to practical skills and, and skills that are aligned with uh, Workforce demand is likely to help lead to enhanced employment and, 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 and compensation in that employment. Um, also, you know, the opportunities to do work-based learning and find out what it means to be in a workplace and how to do that effectively uh, is, is certainly uh, or, 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 or most likely related to uh, the, those better employment outcomes. And then certainly the, you know, the opportunity to develop social skills. Uh, or, or, or understand the social context of employment. And then on the college side, you know, there's lots of good alignment between high school CTE programs and, and two-year programs at community colleges or certificate programs at the community colleges. And so in many ways, that level, that degree of alignment makes any sort of positive benefit on two-year college going, uh, you know, less surprising. Um, you know, it's also relatively unsurprising that, that four-year college going rates are, are lower on average for students who are CTE concentrators in some of this work, in part because students have either different preferences or different knowledge about the potential payoff to either entering the workforce right away or, or continuing in, in career-aligned programs in community colleges. And so while in general we might look at sort of a negative effect on four-year college enrollment as bad, uh, in this instance, I think we have to take a pretty nuanced interpretation uh, to think about kind of whether and how uh, that, that could occur and, in fact, whether or not that, in fact, that would be a good sign. Um, and, and I also think that in, in our Connecticut work where we can see students five to seven years after high school, what we see is initially there's a difference in college going, uh, but by the time students are age 23, there's no difference, which suggests you know, that, that maybe it's about the kind of the timing of, of college enrollment uh, that students invest in college when, when they find a pathway that makes sense or is aligned with what they want to do or when they make a decision that what they've been doing is no longer what they want to do. And so it makes, you know, sense to, to, to make the investment at that point. Um, you know, when we think about just measuring CT impacts and outcomes in general, I think you know, what we think CTE should affect depends partially on how you interpret the role of CTE. That role is, is likely going to be different on a student-by-student -student basis. Um, you know, we're going to focus on wages and employment for students who, who don't intend to go to college or for whom completing high school uh, has been a challenge. Um, we're going to think about transitions to post-secondary training uh, maybe differently for different subpopulations of students, and we're going to think about just general learning and school completion as, as you know, in alignment with, with, other, for, with other student experiences. Um, in particular, you know, students less likely to enroll in college, either for family uh, 
income or other personal circumstances, students from lower income families who are going to need to uh, most likely work while in college, uh, or for students with disabilities uh, in particular who may have IEPs and transition plans that explicitly focus on transition from high school into the workforce. Uh, and, and so again, I, I think what, you know, what we measure and what we consider a good outcome is going to largely depend on the student population uh, we're focused on. Um, so in terms of challenges ahead, I will click through these a little, a little faster because uh, these are things that could be done and have not yet been done, um, though I'm starting some work on teacher workforce data. You know, uh, Understanding where CTE teachers come from uh, and where they go when they leave teaching uh, can tell us a lot about how we effectively recruit, train, and retain CTE teachers. Um, you know, I think there's lots more work to, to do on program alignment uh, to align with labor market needs, though, as states are developing their Perkins plans, that's a key element of this. And then just ensuring quality and value of CTE programs uh, is going to be critical. And then I don't think, though I've not mentioned throughout, that, that it's, you know, even though CTE has become more policy relevant uh, and a part of the conversation, um, there are still persistent questions about stigma and, and sort of uh, not part, only partially informed notions of, about college going uh, that, that, that could uh, inhibit some students' you know, ability or, or willingness to, to participate in CTE in high school. Um, so, uh, I, I think I'm going to jump past some of this other than to say uh, how CTE teachers get certified uh, is, is even more highly variable than how other teachers get certified. Typically, there are some pathways through traditional teacher prep programs, but most of them come through occupational pathways uh, that involve some you know, combination of work experience and some provisional license screening uh, and or test taking. Um, but there's a lot of variation. Uh, changes in those policies seem to be linked to workforce needs, uh, but sort of understanding how, how this works and, and how we effectively recruit and retain people will be uh, increasingly important as CTE interest and participation grows among students. Um, you know, as we, as we proceed, I mentioned there's some research on the horizon where we're trying to learn from new policy innovations. I think this transition to, to the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, and the Perkins reauthorization and this pivot from college for all to college and career readiness is going to create some real opportunity to, to learn from policy innovation and policy change across states. Um, and I think sort of the expansion of measures and enhancement of state longitudinal data systems to include uh, some certificate information or, or other uh, measures of, of, of kind of work-based work learning or workforce development engagement will provide some good opportunities to, to learn more about how CTE is working for whom and under what conditions. Um, and so uh, just before I conclude, I, I want to uh, raise your, bring to your attention, if you don't already know about it, is uh, there used to be a national research center on CTE um, and that hasn't existed for a few years. Uh, but the way uh, in, in the Institute for Education Sciences and, and the Office of Career, and Career Technical and Adult Education in the federal government has reinvested is through the CTE Research Network, where we're, we're trying to create a network of scholars, practitioners, and policymakers uh, to focus on you know, research, training, uh, coordination of research and interpretation, the dissemination of research in, in ways that hasn't been as systematic. Uh, uh, in recent years as it could be, and we think this is an exciting uh, place to share resources through, through our website, through our, our Twitter handles, uh, and through our newsletters, but also to try to bring together a larger community of folks who are interested in, in learning more about CTE research and getting access to sort of research that's on the vanguard in CTE uh, and into sharing that research with the broad community of CTE age folks. Um, a few other efforts, uh, MDRC has been invested in this in a long time, and, and they've got a revitalized Center on Effective Career and Technical Education, and I think some exciting work that, that's uh, an outstanding leadership connected there. There's also the CTE Exchange, which is a, a multi-state uh, CTE research effort that I'm a part of. Uh, I partner with Massachusetts, 
uh, Celeste Crothers, I mentioned earlier, in partnership with Tennessee, and, and Dan Kreisman at Georgia State, along with Thomas Goldring, in, in partnership with Brian Jacob and folks in, at the state of Michigan. And, and for, for state-level folks, this is something that we're interested in expanding and, and hoping that we can learn by studying across state contexts of how and, and, and CTE is, is, is benefiting students and under what conditions. 